Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Indeed, my name is Simo Huotari. I'm from the Department of Physics, University of Helsinki. I'm an experimentalist uh, doing different kinds of spectroscopies. And I have uh, uh, very much fun working with you guys from the SECAM and, um, and, uh, and from theory part, uh, side, I think that experimentalists need to understand what the theory does, how to run simple calculations, uh, what, what kind of things we can expect from theory. And on the other side, I think it's important for those who do calculations and theory to understand what the experiments can, can do and what are the possible, you know, caveats in, in analyzing, interpreting experiment data, what you can learn from the experiments. This kind of interaction is very fruitful and very important. So uh, I will start with the introduction of spectroscopies in the frequency space. And... Uh, The outline of uh, this lecture is that I will start first with some fundamentals, then I will talk about energy loss spectroscopies, uh, photo emission, and then some optical spectroscopies. And at any time, don't hesitate to ask questions, and I'm here until at least Wednesday afternoon, so that if you have questions, if you, if you have a question that I can't answer right away, I'm sure that we can find an answer uh, soon enough. Spectroscopy, what I, I like to think about it is that it's... Um, uh, it's, it's sending a kind of a probe to a system on an atomic scale. We, we, we uh, somehow disturb the system and then look the, at the response, what the system does. In fact. So it involves some kind of uh, excitation in the system and then looking at the response. This is unlike many static structural probes like, uh, you know, for example, take X-ray diffraction or electron microscopy that look at the static structures. We are making some kind of disturbance to the system and it, in the, the um, Important for the calculation is to be able to model the excited state and how it propagates and dynamics. So for example, uh, we send a light and look at, for example, the probability for absorption of the light in the system, and then measure the spectrum of the absorption. Um, the attenuation in the, in the sample is dictated by beer lambert's law. And then from the beer lambert's law, we can calculate the absorption coefficient either in X-ray range with talk of uh, we would designate that with mu if we are looking at atomic excitations with X-rays, inner core shell electrons or alpha as a function of wavelength if we are talking of optical absorption, but it's, it's the same thing in principle uh, from, the, uh, from the dynamics point of view. So what is measured is the attenuation coefficient, which has a unit of one over length. And um, probing depth of, of such a probe uh, in a material is then proposal the inverse of the attenuation length. So it, uh, that's the uh, penetration depth of the, of the, of the, of the uh, probe in the material. And that has very strong implications on what kind of systems one can study with different wavelengths. Some wavelengths are very, uh, make the uh, experiment very surface sensitive, and then you're looking at very first atomic layers, and some certain wavelengths can go, go deeper into the materials, and then you look at the bulk of the materials. They have, you have different physics, and this has to be taken into account. Uh, I have been working mostly with combining this with scattering. So we don't absorb the particle in the system, but we uh, create the perturbation and the particle still continues coming out of the system, possibly changes the direction, possibly it loses uh, uh, energy to the system and emerges. And then we measure the spectrum of the outgoing X-rays or uh, photons. Yeah, or alternatively, of course, what can happen is that uh, we uh, create other type of secondary particles that emerge from the system, for example, uh, photoelectrons that are measured with photoelectron spectroscopy. So combining these kind of things, we can send in different probes and look at different things that happen. This uh, creates a myriad of different kinds of spectroscopies that uh, are summarized in, in this is, a, this is a still limited view, of course, there are a lot of different kind of secondary uh, spectroscopies that exist in the, in the world. My uh, expertise is in the photon, in photon, out spectroscopy mostly. Um, we can come in a photon, and if we are looking at the photo coming out, it's emission, Raman scattering, resonance scattering, different kind of uh, nonlinear uh, optical phenomena, high harmonic generation. Uh, if we come in with a photon and look at electrons, we can look at photo emission and original electrons emitted by the system. 
we can come in with an electron and uh, look at photons coming out in cathode luminescence or inverse photo emission. We can come in with an electron and look at electron coming out uh, and all, all kinds of uh, different things can, can, can happen. And this is, of course, uh, would uh, require several books to write, write, uh, write about all these spectroscopies. Typically, we are measuring units, uh, wavelengths, either in nanometers, in angstroms, energies in electron volts. Obviously, it doesn't make any sense to use SI units. Uh, I hope, uh, I mean, you, you probably uh, are, are, have forgotten about uh, using SI units. Anyway, already at that point, just a reminder. Um, and for photons, there's a very useful relation for the wavelength and the energy of the photon uh, by the conversion factor that is basically the Planck's constant times speed of light. So it gives you a, a inverse ratio of electron uh, 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 energy in electron volts and um, wavelength in angstroms if you uh, take 12,398 divided by lambda in angstroms, you get the electron volts and vice versa. And uh, yeah, so this is this is kind of the range of uh, uh, different probing depth of different particles. So if we come into the photon, it's it's we are probing different kind of material than what we are probing with electrons. Sometimes one puts together electron uh, spectra and photon spectra on the same system, basically in principle studying the same material, but but the result is different. Why would that be? Is that uh, we are looking at either the surface or the bulk? And if we are looking at uh, electrons, the probing depth of electrons, the uh, inelastic mean free path of an electron in a solid state system, follows this kind of curve, uh, roughly speaking, similar to all materials. It's called the universal curve for that reason. Not exactly, it depends on the, uh, on the material a little bit, but they fall more or less on this, this uh, same curve. And it shows that typical uh, electrons travel in materials only a nanometer or, or less. One can tune that by changing the uh, kinetic, by, by looking at different kinetic energies of electrons. So the further, uh, the higher in energy you go, the deeper uh, the electrons, for example, emerge from the material. So you can tune the surface sensitivity by tuning the particle energy. Um, photons travel much deeper in material. So same energy of a photon, we are talking of uh, from ultraviolet to the X-ray range. Uh, go into the bulk, uh, several hundreds of nanometers, even micrometers. And this is an example for water. For photons, this, uh, this curve depends very much on the material. So in this case, the uh, inelastic mean free path for a photon, if we uh, use the terminology, increases as a function of uh, increasing energy until certain absorption edges take place. In this case, uh, that corresponds to an oxygen K edge, oxygen 1S electron. It start to be excited by photons above 500, 500 electron volts because that's the binding energy of uh, the oxygen 1S. Um, so, by the way, here is a trivia. We know that these this core electrons are designated by the principal quantum number and then the orbital quantum number. So, for example, the deepest line core level is 1S. And uh, different nomenclature is used for is, 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 is uh, labeling this with letters starting with K. So the one is the deepest core level is K, and then L and M and so forth. Why it starts with a K? Why not with A if it's the first deepest core level and you start counting them? It's always K is the lowest. Have you ever thought about that? Basic atomic physics. Uh, uh, Lesson tells you that we start with K shell and so on. But did you ever ask why why K? Why not some other letter? Nobody knows. Distinguished professors. Was it was it some some German name? No. Said German said German word? No. No. That, that would that would be a good uh, guess. Uh, however, the reason is more practical. When the people were looking at these uh, atomic lines uh, for the first time, and they thought of Berkeley quantum mechanics at that point, they were not sure if this uh, shortest wavelength light that they got from an atom uh, atomic spectrum would actually correspond to the low to, to be the shortest uh, wavelength. So, just in uh, sure, just to be sure that they have some space to go. 
uh, towards even deeper core levels than the 1s. They started uh, from, from K, so that one can go even, even further. Uh, it was a coincidence, basically, that, uh, that it had to happen to be the lowest possible uh, state, uh, by the highest binding energy state that they were looking at. So they could have started with A. It's actually Barkla and co-workers write in their article that we could start with A, but let's make, make sure that we have a possibility to extend later on. Anyway, so what happens uh, when, when an electron beam, for example, interacts with the material? So this shows a simplified picture of, uh, of the uh, inelastic mean free part of electrons, but uh, actually a lot of things happen. If you come in with a primary electron beam, uh, look at the, uh, what happens is that there's a certain volume of primary, ex uh, primary excitation where the electrons are um, attenuated in the material, but they create a lot of excitations that can uh, cause uh, secondary electrons to come out. So you excite another electron from the material that, co that comes out. Um, if uh, uh, the electron beam has enough energy to create core level uh, excitations, characteristic X-rays from those core, uh, by, by, by decay of those core level excitations can come out. And if you're looking at those, then they have a, a larger probing depth because the X-rays uh, can come out from, from the deeper core of the material. And, uh, but electrons always come from the surface and X-rays can probe the uh, deeper into the bulk. That's, that's my, uh, maybe the most important message on this slide. The interaction, so for the photons, um, we use the so-called minimal substitution. So the photon interacting with the particle uh, electron, so electron momentum is uh, substituted by the momentum minus the, um, the uh, uh, no, uh, I'm losing my words. The vector potential, sorry, a capital A of the of the uh, photon field, and this means that uh, the Hamiltonian for the kinetic energy, which is the momentum squared divided by two m, uh, is actually broken then down to two main terms, which has uh, uh, the vector potential squared term and then uh, the vector potentials uh, dot product with the electron momentum in the second term. And uh, if you plug that into a calculation of uh, transition rate using Fermi's golden rule up to second order, you can see that uh, there is uh, there's the first order interaction that if you go into the A squared term means that the um, number of photons doesn't change. One photon comes in and one photon goes out. So that's, that describes scattering. In the first order, the P dot A term uh, causes one photon to be either destroyed or created. So that describes absorption or emission. And uh, then if you're looking at the second order, um, the P dot A term is important there and it causes resonance scattering. It involves a possibility of uh, reaching virtual final state, uh, intermediate states. The photon is absorbed. Uh, creates an intermediate state that then decays into some other state that is closer to the, can be the original ground state or some other lower energy state. And the important factor is that there is a resonance term here that can go, that, that, that can be um, very small if the, the incident uh, um, photon energy is close to the intermediate state energy, and that can enhance uh, many, many uh, resonance uh, um, uh, in, in the resonance spectrum, many, uh, many of these intermediate states and then can, can, can give more information than the first uh, order term. The probability for scattering, so I'm, I'm now focusing a little bit here on the scattering part, uh, is measured by cross-section. Uh, cross-section is the measure of, uh, of the probability for interaction. In this case, I'm, I'm uh, talking about, sc about scattering, but the same uh, refers to for, for absorption as well. So the cross section is another funny thing. It has, uh, we don't use SI units because the numbers would be very small. We are using a unit called barn. And the barn is, is a big you know, uh, building. And uh, it was discussed during the Cold War originally when the uh, nuclear um, fission was uh, was thought about how to create actually a chain reaction. Uh, somebody said that we it's it's not possible because the 
because the cross section is so small. And somebody said that look, the uranium nucleus is big as a barn. You cannot possibly uh, miss uh, hitting that with the neutron. So that's why the unit is barn. And then we use kilobarns and megabarns and so on. So then differential cross sections can measure the probability of a particle to be scattered into a certain angle. And doubly differential cross section can measure the probability of a particle to be scattered into a certain angle and uh, has a certain frequency interval. So the second one is more, very important for, for the spectroscopy uh, from uh, of, of scattering. So another slide about uh, electron uh, photon interaction. So what happens is that if you look at the vector potential, it has this important part is this uh, oscillatory field and then uh, the uh, photon polarization vector that when they couple the, to, the, to the A dot B term, one uses often the dipole approximation which says that this exponential is very small. Uh, exponential uh, K dot R is very small because the, in optical light, the momentum of the light is, is negligible. It doesn't really carry a momentum to speak of. So one puts this to one and then one gets the uh, formula for photon absorption. Uh, and, and uh, inversely per emission, but dictated by what is the, uh, remaining is uh, the is the uh, um, polarization vector um, uh, multiplied uh, dot product with uh, with the electron uh, position vector, and this gives rise to the absorption and emission spectroscopies. In scattering, we cannot neglect that exponential term, and it turns out that the, the momentum, uh, if we are looking at uh, for example, what I do mostly is X-rays. The momentum of an X-ray photon can be very large compared to uh, inverse inter-electron uh, distances. And this means that this exponential does not necessarily need to be one. And uh, one can reach higher uh, momentum transfers that are relevant. Sometimes we use K and sometimes Q for the momentum. So don't get confused by that. It, it depends uh, on the literature, uh, which paper you are looking at. Um, so now then the, the electron electron scattering in, 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 instead is dictated by a slightly different Hamiltonian and very importantly here the momentum transfer is in uh, the denominator of the of the factor before the exponential so that this means that uh, at small momentum transfers the scattering probability is very large and it becomes very small uh, small when uh, when the momentum transfer becomes very uh, large so, so the same type of exponential as in the photon scattering, but additional factor, strong enhancement of the scattering probability at low values of Q. So this means that electrons are very strongly forward scattered. This term gives rise to the so-called electron energy loss spectroscopy or EUX. It's usually done for very precisely uh, thin, uh, small uh, prepared small samples that can transmit electrons through. And then we are looking at the forward scattering after the interaction with the sample. So this means that the, uh, the, if you have a particle of a sample, it has to be very small in the nanometer range in order to really, or a thin film. So typical quantities that are measured in these spectroscopies is the di dielectric function. I'm sure that uh, in the hands-on session, you will be calculating many different dielectric functions. We have a, a real part and an imaginary part. And basically all the optical quantities can be derived from there. The complex refractive index, reflectivity, uh, absorption coefficient is related to the imaginary part of the refractive index. Um, and the loss function is the um, imaginary part of the inverse of the uh, of the macroscopic uh, dielectric function. And uh, then we have also a spectral function, uh, what uh, is used often in photoemission spectroscopy. Okay, so I already start with the basics for the energy loss spectroscopies, but if you look at the Processes that are electron energy loss and uh, uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy and inelastic scattering of light. They, the experimental setup in a, in a schematic way looks very similar. You come in with a particle, it interacts with a sample as scatters, uh, the direction changes, and the energy of the particle changes, and then you measure the probability uh, through the, uh, the, 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 the double differential cross section. 
you can give a momentum transfer to the system and energy transfer. And this, these are both important quantities to carry and, and uh, in the calculation as a parameter. And then in EELS terminology, people talk about the loss function, which is uh, um, the same as uh, what we call in, in inelastic X-ray scattering, we call it the dynamic structure factor. There is a, uh, because of this interaction, uh, um, probability had this Q squared in the yields part. It ha ha appears here again in order to normalize the dynamic structure factor to the loss function. So the dynamic structure factor is basically Q squared times the loss function. What is most often coming out from the code is the loss function and then it's just multiplied by Q squared. Uh, in order to get the dynamic structure factor. This means that the, for the eels, you get very strong signal at very small momentum transfers. But when you go to the dynamic structure factor for in, in elastic X-ray scattering terminology, you have multiplied that by, by Q squared. Everything that is, has low momentum transfer goes basically to zero. So electrons are good at looking at low momentum transfers and X-rays are in elastic X-ray scattering is good at looking at higher momentum transfers. The loss function can then reveal phonons, molecular vibrations, different kind of valence excitations, plus moans. And then um, if we go even to the core loss region for higher energy transfers, one can look at core elect electron excitations. Uh, and uh, But, but I, I guess we are focusing here on this valence part. So important things that you get out are different kind of uh, uh, interfan transitions and, and, and uh, plus monic losses. The plasmon in metals is the simplest to explain so that when you create the plasmon is a uh, uh, collective uh, uh, wave of the charge density. In a metal that's easiest to explain that if you put a metal, piece of metal into an electric field, the electric field pushes part of the electrons to one direction and then one, until you reach an equilibrium. But if you remove that electric field, then there's a wave back and then oscillatory behavior that goes, goes back to the uh, original charge density. Uh, and uh, that oscillation is, is the plus mode. It has a certain specific frequency that depends on the, the number of electrons in the system, the density of electrons. And in, in, uh, if you look at the loss function, the plus mode loss is, is seen as a point when you look at the real and imaginary part of the dielectric function you see a uh, zero crossing of the real part when the imaginary part is small, it creates a strong peak. And, and that corresponds to the plus bone uh, loss of, uh, of, of electron to a plus, uh, loss of energy uh, of the incoming particle to a plus bone excitation. Plus bone has a relevant um, role in optical properties because all those electromagnetic waves that has a frequency lower than, lower than the plasma frequency are expelled from exp uh, entering the material because uh, the material can then respond with uh, uh, creating an uh, uh, electric field by, by the plasma, uh, um, by, by, um, uh, by screening the, uh, char uh, with the charges the, the, this electromagnetic field. But when the electromagnetic field starts to have a frequency higher than the plasma, then uh, the screening is no longer efficient because of plus mode excitations. And uh, the reflectivity, if you calculate it from, from this uh, uh, free electron theory for a metal is one until full re reflectivity. So that's why metals are shining. They reflect light until uh, the light has the frequency uh, higher than the plus mode frequency. And then the material becomes partly transparent. Aluminium has a plus mode energy of 15.8. Uh, electron volts. So it means that aluminum is uh, reflective for all light that has energy uh, below 15.5 electron volts. That's so in the ultraviolet range, it becomes transparent. We have done a lot of work studying plasmons in metals uh, and uh, uh, using um, uh, TDLDA, TDDFT. Uh, all the nice uh, computational methods that you have at hand. And we can see the plasmon excitation as predicted in the previous slide in the from, from free electron uh, gas theory. Um, we can see a uh, energy loss peak that then disperses towards higher energies when you increase momentum transfer, it becomes 
broader and, and basically decays at, after certain cutoff momentum transfer into electron hole pairs. You can have surface plasmons and uh, plasmonics in nanoparticles is an active uh, field of research. So uh, the plasmon excitations are very, very fundamentally, uh, very fundamentally important, and you will see that in, in, in the results of your calculations. So the inelastic X-ray scattering experiments need a synchrotron uh, radiation source, which uh, I was just uh, recently I came came to Lausanne from ESRF, which is in Grenoble. Uh, there are several synchrotrons around the world, and one can apply for beam time for your experiment if you have a nice material that you want to study uh, and, and their excitation properties. Make a calculation and say that we see in calculation this nice thing that we predict and would like to see that in an experiment, and we can do a proposal for a, for a synchrotron beam time together. In an elastic X ray scattering experiment, the beam is coming from a synchrotron radiation source. It's, it's focused and, and monochromatized to a certain bandwidth that we want. And then uh, the beam interacts with the sample, and then we measure with a uh, crystal spectrometer the spectrum of the outgoing photons, and that leads then to the measurement of this uh, inelastic scattering spectrum. Typical incident photon energies are measured in kiloelectron volts. Typical momentum transfers are measured in several uh, inverse angstroms. This, this bears a relevance when you are looking at what kind of excitations one can look at. So I have a funny, funny story. <laughs> I, I, I feel really tired because, you know, uh, at the synchrotron facility, this beam line is actually quite, quite big. It's a lead, lead uh, room. And uh, you're not supposed to be there when the experiment is going because there's very high intensity X-rays and you don't want to, uh, the, your body to interact with the X-rays. So you have to close this hatch by searching it so that uh, you make sure that there's nobody in and there's a certain button that you have to press that you prove that you have gone into the hatch to check that there's nobody. And then you leave and close and then you can start your experiment. Unfortunately, usually, located next to emergency stop button and uh, last night, uh, the night before, uh, Exactly at midnight between Saturday and Sunday, somebody pressed this red emergency button instead of the green search button. And this means that all the electricity of the whole beam line went down, all everything. We were nearly tripping the whole synchrotron, but luckily only our beam line was, was tripped. So it took uh, record time, I think 12 hours to recover uh, the experiment back together. But of course, if it happens at midnight, then, you know, I lost one night. <laughs> Yesterday I arrived here, said that you're gonna, I'm not going to go for dinner because I was so tired. So when you are um, at the secret of the impact. Do theory, right? That's right. <laughs> at the bottom line, this is the do theory rather than experiment. Is yes, that exactly. <laughs> Follow the instructions given by your uh, uh, teacher in this school um, and, and, and elsewhere as well. Good. Great. So that's uh, just uh, when, when we are doing an experiment together, I will teach you how to do, that. do not press the images button. Okay, so of course we can increase the energy transfer and then look at not only the valence and, and plasmon excitations and, uh, and the interband transitions, but we can also start seeing the core electron excitations. Uh, in a calculation, this means that you have to go deeper and deeper and uh, higher and higher energies, and at certain point you should see this is core level excitations, and uh, they indeed uh, stem from then um, um, having enough energy in the either by the by the incoming um, particle or in the energy transfer process to create a core level excitation, and these are very useful to pr um, because they are uh, sensitive to the chemistry of the material. So a similar way that X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is used to identify different chemical species, this can be used to identify different uh, uh, and measure the unoccupied states by, by this probing electron that is created uh, into uh, the unoccupied states from the core level. Good. In terms of time, I guess I'm doing badly because we had uh, technical issues. Mm -hmm. I briefly mentioned the photo emission spectroscopy. So in this case, a photon interacts with a sample and uh, it will be absorbed by, by, the, by an electron in, this, in the system, which is then excited. And this is what Einstein got the Nobel Prize from explaining the photoelectric effect. Already at that point, they saw that ultraviolet light can, can remove electrons from a metal. 
And uh, this is uh, nowadays called uh, PES, photo emission spectroscopy, or UPS for ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy. And if one looks at the uh, emission angle of the, of the um, outgoing electron with respect to the incoming photon source, one can probe the angular distribution of uh, the momentum uh, spectral function of the, of the electrons. And uh, then it's called angle result photo emission spectroscopy. And that's very useful for measuring band structures on, on surfaces of materials. But again, the first atomic layers, it's ex excellent, for example, to look at 2D materials because it's very sensitive to the one atomic layer. What is measured is the, in the, um, such an experiment is the kinetic energy of the outgoing photoelectron and its direction. So from that, you can map out uh, the, um, uh, the um, spectral function. And uh, the, then the binding energy or the, or the electron energy when it was in the solid state system or on the, in the original system is the incoming photon energy minus the uh, kinetic energy minus then also something that is called a work function that is uh, something that we experimentally then determine by calibrating the instrument. It's the extra work needed for the um, electron to uh, be emitted from the material surface into the vacuum. That's an that's a experimental parameter, but what is interesting is that we can have access to the original electron energy as a function of its momentum in an RFS experiment. And in this case, again, a, a schematic from a synchrotron uh, RFS experiment a beam from a synchrotron is uh, focused and monochromatized uh, onto a small spot on the sample, and then the variety of uh, electron emission directions is measured by this kind of thing that is uh, so called hemispherical electron analysis. It's based on electromagnetic lenses, and it can map out the kinetic energy and then the emission angle of the photoelectron simultaneously onto a 2D detector. And it's very very useful in order to be able to look at band dispersion the Fermi surfaces of materials. <clears throat> so the instruments look look like this. So there's uh, the beam coming in. It, everything has to be then an ultra high vacuum. It's very important because electrons pro, uh, the inelastic mean free path also in the atmospheric pressures is very low. So everything has to be in vacuum. Um, and this shows. Uh, or such a thing looks look in reality. So people are always asking why is it wrapped in aluminum foil and it's for cleaning the making the vacuum better by by um, so-called baking process. So it the uh, underneath the aluminum foils there are heating coils, and uh, the before before an experiment run uh, for the vacuum to be better. Uh, one must heat the system so that the, all the dirt from the interior surfaces come out and it's going into the pump. That's another thing. If the electricity of a beam line goes down, all the pumps stop. And uh, then if you lose the vacuum everywhere, then it's a big disaster to clean up for, for several weeks. But yeah, so the measurement is effectively then of the spectral function. Uh, and uh, it's... Uh, Basically, uh, um, uh, measuring the one electron removal pro probability, and of course, it's related to the band structure and density of states in a non interacting electron system. It consists of a sharp peak at the specific uh, uh, electron uh, energy and momentum from the original band structure. But of course, then it, uh, because of uh, many body interaction in electron electron interaction, spreads out and uh, um, the probability density function uh, is changed so that we have a for the momentum a distribution function, not no longer a probability of finding an electron one exactly below the Fermi level and zero above the Fermi level, but it smears out. Uh, some of the electrons are promoted above the Fermi level due to the electron electron interaction. And, uh, and uh, this, is, this is one important thing to keep in mind in, in the calculations, although that's a, that's a many body problem uh, to measure the spectra, to, to calculate the spectral function. But ARPES is fantastic in measuring really the band structure of very uh, thin materials and, and surfaces. So 
uh, like I said, graphene, for example, this is the canonical band structure of graphene. So it consists of this linear uh, dispersion, linearly dispersing Dirac cones. You can measure that in, uh, in this example, for example, one can see the Fermi level and the Dirac point and this crossing, crossing uh, Dirac cones. Or then in uh, temp uh, high, high temperature superconductor, so this, in, this is an example of an iron based superconductor. One can look at the quasi particle dispersion near the Fermi level, which is important for understanding the, the, the origin of the superconductivity in, in this system. One can combine that with inverse photoemission, which then when the photoemission measures the occupied states, but it cannot obtain information of the non-occupied state because there are no electrons to come from there. Uh, if you take instead the, the inverse process where you take an electron from vacuum and put it on the unoccupied states, then photon is released by the uh, so-called uh, Bremsstrahlung uh, radiation when the electron is stopped. And um, then this can measure the uh, unoccupied states. So this is an example of nickel oxide. Uh, it's an old picture, so that, 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 that's how uh, uh, plots in the PRL looked uh, back at that time. Small dots, sorry about that, I hope you can see. So there's a photo emission spectrum from the occupied states, and then one can measure the band gap precisely. Nickel oxide is one of these systems that if you plug it into an up in it, uh, it will tell you that it's a metal, but in reality, it's a white, camp, white band, band cap insulator. It, uh, it's a strongly correlated system because of a single electron picture cannot, cannot capture this behavior. And then one can measure the, uh, also the uh, density of states of the unoccupied states and, and the band cap. Interesting uh, development in this field is going time resolved. Uh, what is very useful is to be able to do so-called pump and probe experiments. So you have an external pump, maybe a laser pulse or something that excites the system into uh, uh, out of the ground state. And then you probe that excited state. And then you can look at the dynamics really in real time, what happens when the, when the uh, system is excited into in the new state and then how that decays. And that uh, brings very interesting information on the light induced uh, dynamics, relaxation processes, different kind of uh, non-equilibrium phenomena in matter. And this is how we can really uh, tune the, uh, the properties of material by, by, by making by making new type of uh, state of matter by, by bringing it to an uh, excited state. So this is a very active field if you combine pump and probe in the attosecond, femtosecond, or picosecond time ranges to reveal the real-time dynamics in materials. Okay, yeah, so last thing, a uh, couple of words about uh, optical spectroscopy. So I somehow I always tend to talk about X-rays because I, I, that's where I did most of my work. Um, but photons in the optical light is, is typically, then the, the nomenclature is slightly different, like I said, so that um, what one measures in a UV ultraviolet or visible light spectroscopy is, uh, is the same thing, the absorbance of uh, light when it travels through the material and the absorbance spectrum then has many different kind of interesting information on the molecular species present in the system, the excitations you can create there. And what measures is the absorbance is uh, in, in such an experiment with the UV vis spectroscopy is often used for molecular uh, speciation in, in uh, samples that are uh, made in a liquid form. So the absorbance is related to the concentration of the interesting sample in the, in the uh, um, and, and, and then the absorption uh, spectrum. And uh, this is possible to do in the ultra, ultraviolet and visible light region in a, in a small laboratory scale instruments like shown here. But if one wants to go to vacuum ultraviolet and X, on the other hand, uh, the, the uh, higher en energy is then one, one uh, has this uh, spectroscopy done at synchrotron light sources because they are more powerful. And But the principle somehow is always the same. You have a light source, source of particles, in this case, a lamp uh, in, in the lab, 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 laboratory scale instrument is a deuterium lamp or tungsten halogen, halogen lamp. Uh, 
you have some kind of monochromator or in this case a polychromator, this some kind of kind of dispersion device that sorts out different wavelengths in the different directions. You choose what wavelength you want to use. Uh, in this case, if you have a spectrum from a prism, I can then choose by a slit which wavelength you want to take out and then put that uh, crossing your sample and then the detector measures how many photos. Come. Or you can put the sample into this nice fan of different colors if it's homogeneous and then have a position sensitive detector that then uh, looks at the left, you have a blue light and the right, you have red light and, and your image tells you the spectrum because you can look at the image and, and calibrate uh, calibrate for the dispersion. And then the last example of, uh, of what I was planning to show is optical ellipsometry. In, so, sorry, yeah. so in the previous slide, then uh, this is essentially based on the, on the VR Lambert law. Yes, this kind of yes, uh, yes, exactly. So that means that it's only in transmission, essentially. This uh, this kind of experiment. Transmission experiments are always based on the VR Lambert law, and then you. So that means the thin films because we, we need to have uh, hmm. the probability of going through right in some way. Yes. In 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 such an experiment, one must plan the sample so that there is some transmission because you need to measure at least some photons that are uh, transmitted. Because if you have zero. A full absorbance, then that, that doesn't tell you anything. But then the sample must uh, absorb enough so that there's a contrast between uh, no absorbing and, and part, partially absorbing part of the spectrum. So that means that the constant, either the concentration, that's why that's why this experiment is, is done in a, in a kind of a solution, let's say, that you, you, you choose an in, the interesting sample and then you calculate what is the concentration of the sample that you can have so that you optimize the transmission. Or if you can prepare the sample to be a thin film or, or mix it with some, uh, it could be, in this case, I'm showing liquid solution, but also solid solution. If you take some non-absorbing uh, material as a buffer and mix it and prepare a pellet, that's also a possibility. For the optical light, it's tricky because the buffer material has to be optically transparent. So that's why it's used uh, in, in a liquid uh, solution. Yeah, and then the optical ellipsometry is something that you encounter. Uh, it's a tool that can determine both the real part and the complex part, uh, the, the imaginary part of the refractive index, so the full complex refractive index or the dielectric function, conversely. Uh, it's done usually to measure the surface or and thin films uh, optical properties. It's again a small lab, lab scale device where light is coming uh, and shining on a, on a surface of a sample. And then what, what, what measure is uh, as a function of the incoming light polarization, the, the, um, the reflectance. And uh, one can, by, by including this polarization into the business, one can measure the phase difference and the amplitude ratio of the reflectivities of of the different kinds of uh, light, different polarization light that is reflected. And now, um, then one builds a, builds a model, one basically solves the Fresnel equations in, in a system that you know that, okay, I have grown a film of certain interesting material on, on a substrate. And then I calculate basically what happens, what I expect to happen for the light when it's reflected from some, such a system, it could reflect directly from the surface of the film or it could be um, uh, transmitted into the film, but then reflected from the uh, interface of the film and the substrate, or it could go different ways, different paths, and, and, and then uh, the reflectivity is the sum of all, the, all this. And then what, what one can get after fitting uh, the propagation of light and solving the light propagation equation in the material, comparing with the experiment, one can get uh, both the, complex, uh, the, the imaginary part and the real part of the refractive index uh, after this uh, calculation process. And that, that's the kind of canonical example. So uh, famous paper five, uh, Francesco Sottile was, uh, was uh, studying the uh, imaginary part of the, this was uh, what material, now I can't see, silicon. 
comparing it to the measurements using optical ellipsometry and uh, looking at the absorption spectrum. And this was not an absorption spectrum of silicon, it was the absorption spectrum calculated from the optical ellipsometry measurement, which is the, should yield the same result. Oh, you mean the, the Cardone experiment? Yes. Yeah, yeah the work, the lips Yes, exactly. So that's why all optical ellipsometry is very important because it's the only tool that I know that can measure both the imaginary and real part of the same system. Of course, if you measure the absorption spectrum uh, and one could in principle then use uh, Kramer's chronic transformation using the causality uh, relation uh, to determine what the uh, real part should be, but that would mean uh, that has certain problems related, for example, to the fact that we have only a finite amount you know, number of data points in, in such an experiment. In principle, if we could have infinite number of data points and extend the measurements to from zero, uh, in, minus infinity to plus infinity in, in frequency, then we could uh, for, just fully transform in, in principle to get to the, the, the uh, information on both the real and imaginary parts. However, so uh, this, this is very, very interesting. Uh, type of data. Okay, I think I only wanted to mention something that uh, is now. I, I just last week I had a dinner with the Nobel laureate Anne Lulier from last year who um, developed uh, high harmonic generation and nonlinear uh, optical phenomena for reaching attosecond uh, pulses in of light. And that's related to the fact that uh, uh, one could excite a system from a valence band, electron from a valence band, the conduction band, uh, with a photon that has enough energy to do that, or having several lower frequency photons that um, cannot do that excitation alone. But if they, if there's a strong enough light field in the system, uh, so that these uh, absorption processes happen quasi simultaneously. One can one can uh, reach the electronic state transition with multiple photon trans uh, uh, absorption. So what they did was this. Uh, this was uh, ultraviolet experiments in um, in uh, in a gas phase noble gas molecules, and they actually reached like sixty five photon processes. Sixty five photons absorbed simultaneously by a system and reaching uh, then a very highly excited states and when looking at the excited, uh, decay spectrum of such such uh, um, um, uh, atoms, they saw that this the, the spectrum that is coming out consists of several harmonics, the harmonics of up to like, in this picture that I, I took some, from somewhere up to the 45th uh, harmonic. And one can then sum up these frequencies if they are phase locked uh, and, and choosing the right frequencies, one can then Look at the different different uh, uh, harmonics summed up in a proper manner creates this sync function kind of spectrum that uh, at certain points when the wave field nodes are matching then there's zero intensity uh, in the sum uh, frequency spectrum but when the uh, when the uh, anti nodes are are matching then there's a strong constructive interference creating these pulse patterns which reach then at the second uh, time lengthening time from, from the optical optical source. So this was a novel, novel uh, method to reach very, very short optical policies. We go to then making it possible to do this time result experiments and we are, would be very interesting to do pump and probe on this kind of uh, time scales. But okay, yes, that was, I think, uh, all that I had and I thank you and I'm I'm ready for questions and discussions during these days. Thank you. Thank you.